What's up, everybody? Welcome. Uh, super excited you're here. Today, we're jumping into part four of our message series entitled Oil Change. And this message series has been all about uh, recharging your spiritual batteries, uh, getting you energized, and giving you a fresh feel up. Because how many of you know, sometimes we run real dry, right? Especially here in the Northeast. If you're from New York or New Jersey, we run 90 miles an hour to go absolutely nowhere, and everybody is in a complete rush. I'm sure that's true for many other people uh, throughout the country, but the reality is we get tired, we get tired quick, and we we forget about first things first. Uh, many of us um, sometimes uh, run real hard that it actually negatively impacts our self-care. I did this once on a hike. I went out hiking. It was hot out and I totally forgot to bring sufficient hydration. And I got to tell you, it was one of the scariest moments of my life because I was thirsty. I was so thirsty. And the reality is water, right? Keeps you hydrated, keeps you safe. And when you forget about your self-care and your spiritual self-care, you kind of go down the tubes. And today's message, I want to keep you from going down the tubes. We're going to talk about water and the life-giving power of spiritual water that only Jesus can give you and can only come from Christ himself. So that's what we're going to talk about today is how to stay alive spiritually and how to stay spiritually vibrant. So let's set the context of our discussion today. We're going to be looking at a really thirsty, desperate, tired woman and a thirsty, tired savior who meet over at Jacob's well in Samaria. So let's jump into John 4 verse 4 to 10. Now he, meaning Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sinchar uh, near a plot of ground um, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired uh, as he was from his journey, sat down by the well and it was about noon. So what's really cool here is that this well still exists today. Uh, here's a picture of the map and uh, the well is actually in Sinchar, which is in Samaria, just north of Jerusalem. And uh, here is a picture of the actual well today. It used to, of course, be out in the field, but today they kind of enshrined it, built a building around it. So you could actually go visit this well today. So the reason why we like to share these things is because it makes the Bible alive to you and gives you kind of perspective that these things still exist. So there's Jacob's well, the thirsty woman, midday's going there, and Jesus meets her on her on her trip to the well, right? Verse seven, when the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verse 13, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Did you ever wonder why Jews and Samaritans never got along, right? We read about this a lot and we're always kind of perplexed by it. Well, here's the reality. Israel uh, was already divided into two kingdoms and in 722 BC, before Jesus Christ was born, uh, it was conquered by Syria. So uh, the Assyrian army comes in, conquers uh, Israel, brings Israel into captivity. Um, then uh, invaders and uh, colonists kind of moved in and brought in a bunch of Gentiles with them. And with them came all false idolatry and false uh, beliefs. So any remnant of the Jewish population or the Hebrew population that lived in this area that was not taken into captivity um, had to deal with these invaders and these colonists, right? So then the Southern kingdom, uh, fell to Babylon later on in 600 BC. So now you have them conquered once into captivity by the Assyrian army in 722. And then you have 600 BC by the Babylonian army and they were carried into captivity. And then about 70 years later, what we see is that a remnant of about 43,000 Israelites were allowed to go back to Jerusalem to, be, to rebuild Jerusalem. The problem is in the Northern Kingdom in, uh, in Samaria, what we had were the Samaritans, which were a mix of the Gentiles and remaining Jews that did not make it into captivity. And they, were, they had a little bit of beef and disagreement on rebuilding Jerusalem. So that actually created a feud within the people groups. The Jewish remnant did not like them because they saw them as a people that were kind of watered down on the faith. They were kind of spiritually dried up and that they were... Um they were just following their neighbors, right? The Gentiles, and they were walking away from the faith. And the Sumerians didn't like them because they thought that they were kind of really judgmental and that the Samaritans thought that they were the, the, the true descendants of Israel. So it created a feud that went 550 more years until we get to this story. So this woman 
She identifies Jesus as a Jew and herself as a Samaritan, and she recognizes that they don't associate. And so many of us can relate to her because the Samaritans thought much less of themselves by this time in history. And Jesus represents holiness and righteousness. And so many of you feel like you're far from God. So many of you feel like you're not good enough for God. You feel like, man, you've turned your back on God and now like God is angry at you. But look what happened there. Jesus didn't turn his back on this woman. Jesus culturally could have. He could have responded in anger toward this woman, but he didn't. Jesus was actually very much interested in her as a Samaritan and you and me as a sinner. And so many of us write a bad narrative and script. And this is what drives up our spiritual life life is when we start to believe wrong things about God and we start to misunderstand his graces and his mercy, uh, which scripture says is enduring and his grace never runs dry. But when we don't lean into that, we feel far from God and we feel like his grace has run dry for us. And what we see here is, is a surprise that no matter how bad or ugly you are, no matter what mistakes you've made in your life, no matter where you've been, Jesus is interested in you. Jesus is attracted to you. Scripture says where sin is, grace abounds. So it doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter how far you've walked away from God. Jesus is right there saying, would you come back to me? Would you find your hope and your peace in me? I have a living water for you that if you drink the water I give, you will never thirst again. Doesn't that sound nice? So many of us want so many things in this life. Could you imagine living a life where you felt completely content, that you and your life felt completely like you were in the power and the presence of God and anything you needed that God himself man, he would meet that need for you. So let's get back to verse 10. So Jesus is thirsty and the woman's like, hey, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew. Why would you ask me? And Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. So what is the gift of God? What is Jesus talking about? The gift of God in this context is the favor of God. It is the grace of God. It is Jesus himself. Jesus, a lamb slain, a gift given to the world, a gift given for you and I so that you and I can be made in right standing with God was given as a gift from God. And he and he alone has the ability to quench your spiritual thirst and your spiritual hunger, right? So many of us are thirsty for so many things. And this has kind of become an idiom or a metaphor in our culture today. And like when somebody's really, uh, you know, wanting to be in a relationship and really looking for a girl or a guy, sometimes people are like, yo, you're thirsty, right? Or maybe you really want something and you're drooling over a brand new car or a house. It's like, yo, you're thirsty for it, right? So we kind of recognize that this idea of thirst is about desire. And there's so many things in this life that you and I totally desire and it never adds up. And this woman just couldn't get the metaphor. I almost feel like in this moment, Jesus is like, yo, lady, do you get the metaphor, lady? Because the woman's like, Jesus, the well is deep and you don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get water, right? And this is what Jesus answered her, verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water from this well will thirst again. So the things you go back to, the things you're thirsty for, it's never going to do it. You will never have enough relationship, never enough affirmation. You, you can never get enough uh, validation in your life. You'll never have enough money. You won't go as far in your career as you'd like to go. And then when you get there, you gotta go further. Like we have this insatiable thirst for things. And what Jesus is saying is if, if you keep going back to the wells you go to to get your fill up, you're going to continue to have to go back because it's never going to do it. But if you drink from my well, the water I give, you will never thirst again. And I love this part. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That somehow Jesus deposits something in you, his grace in response to your faith, the Holy Spirit is deposited. That's the living water. And it's gonna well from within your soul. So there's this like moment, this saving encounter with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is deposited within us. And then from within us, the Spirit starts to do do his amazing work. And you start to realize in that moment that the purpose of your life is met, right? Those philosophical uh, 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 things that we desire, right? Like, God, what's the purpose of my life? Why am I here? That the Holy Spirit brings purpose to your life. He reveals to you the reason why you were created. And, and you know what, we, we gotta recognize what Jesus is saying is I will quench your thirst in a way nothing else will. Jesus takes us a little further in John chapter seven, verse 37 to 38. This is what he says. On the last day of the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Let's just stop there. If you have a desire 
If you're thirsty for God, maybe you've been out there in the world and you're feeling spiritually dry and empty. Maybe you're feeling like you're spiritually washed up. Jesus is saying to you, let anyone who is thirsty come to me, anyone. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you feel guilty about. Anyone should come to me. Whoever believes in me, so here's a condition. Whoever places their hope in me, whoever places their trust in me, whoever chooses to believe in me, right? Put their faith in Jesus. As scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus is talking about the spirit here. And the question some of you have right now, right? is like, how does Jesus quench my thirst? Like, how does he do that so that I'll never thirst again? Because in this life, I want a lot of things, but yet scripture says Jesus is promising that he's going to quench my thirst, right? So so the first thing we got to realize is it's about that salvation encounter with Jesus, that all of us long for a relationship with God. Every one of us long to be made right with God. We don't want to live with guilt and shame and mistakes in our life. We want to be forgiven. We want to know that when we die, we're going to go to heaven, right? You and I want to know that. And the first way Jesus quenches your spiritual thirst is with this deep encounter, this salvation encounter with Jesus. There is no other way to God except through Jesus Christ, his son. Jesus says in scripture, right? In order to to know the father, you must know the son. Nobody knows the father unless they know the son and nobody knows the son unless they know the father. The father and the son are one, scripture says, right? There's no other way. So there's this moment where Jesus saves us and in that redeems our life, right? Quenches our thirst. The second part is the Holy Spirit is deposited in all life, scripture says, And it becomes this well that springs up. And every time you're thirsty, every time you're hungry, all you have to do is go back to God. And every time we spend time in this relationship with God, our hearts grow bigger and we have this deeper and deeper experience with God, right? So so oil and water and new wine and scripture all represent the same thing. The power and the presence and the covering of the Holy Spirit in their lives. This is what 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22 says. Now it is God who makes both of us and you stand firm in Christ, right? So it's God who makes us firm in Jesus. He anointed us, right? With oil, right? And has set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts. That's the living water part as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. So what is to come? So, so when we talk about living water, right? What's the well that Jesus is talking about? It's the favor of God. It's the grace of God. What is grace? Grace is the spontaneous, unmerited gift of God. It's favor in the salvation of sinners and the divine influence operating in individuals for their regeneration and sanctification. What in the world does that mean? English, please, right? It means God loves you and he is committed to you. And the moment you become a follower of Jesus, you drink of that living water, the Holy Spirit is birthed inside of you. So God loves you, he's committed to you. The second part is his Holy Spirit, once in you, you become the temple of the most high God. It's it's not that God is out there and you gotta go visit God. God is deposited in here and he is always with me right? So the Holy Spirit changes you to become more like Jesus. So the first part of that in English, right, is that the divine God, he's committed to you and he loves you. The second part is he deposits his spirit deep within you and you become more like Jesus, right? So what am I asking for, right? What's the actions of how do I drink of this water? It's asking God for his grace, grace for salvation, Jesus, I want to go to heaven. Would you forgive me of my sins? Scripture says if we believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit and we make him the Lord and Savior of our life, if we believe that in our heart we're justified, we confess that with our mouth we're saved and we repent and turn from sin, we have his grace for salvation. The second part is we ask him, now that the Holy Spirit's in us, for his grace for obedience. Jesus, would you help me to be able to walk like you've walked, to live like you live, to pick up my cross and follow you? He promises you living water. And when Jesus spoke about living water in this context, she knew what he was talking about. You see, it was common uh, verbiage in that day and age, a common metaphor, this idea of living water. Check out this video. Isn't this waterfall amazing? You can literally feel and hear the power of its flow. It feels like it's powerful and alive. 
This reminds me of Jesus's conversation with the Samaritan woman. Jesus first meets this woman at the well, and you know what's in a well? Dead, stagnant, still water. Then he says this, right? That he can give her living water, and whoever drinks the water he gives will never thirst again. The phrase living water would have made a lot of sense to her. It was a common expression among the people of this time. The phrase living water meant springs, fountains, running streams, waterfalls, in opposition to dead, stagnant water. Basically, it meant any moving, replenishing water system. So Jesus draws this parallel between the spiritual and living water that is moving alive and would never run dry. What Jesus is saying here is that there are things in your life that you hunger and thirst for that will only suffice for a moment and it will keep you having to go back over and over and over again because it will never really do it for you. It will never truly satisfy you. In contrast, Jesus will give you a living water that not only will fill you, and replenish you, but it will also overflow from your life. It will never stop running. It will never run dry. It will never run out. Jesus truly will quench your thirst. See, when Jesus was teaching about living water, he was drawing the parallel between your life and what you and I run to and the opportunity that you and I have to run, from, run to him for a fresh and regular fill up. And the Holy Spirit is deposited, who is with us always. And really the antidote toward materialism in your life, the antidote toward drinking from a stale dead well in your life is being spirit dependent. Being spirit dependent is the greatest antidote toward materialism, chasing the wrong things, those, those dead wells. And it's, God, I just want to worship you. God, I want to press in. And, you know, it, and it's really a, a mind shift for us where we realize that he is indeed our hope. He is indeed our provider, that he is our God who owns a, you know, a thousand cattle on a thousand hills. And man, he's the creator of the heavens and the earth. What will he hold back from you? Nothing. And that's why we put our hope and our trust in Jesus. He keeps us spiritually hydrated. Have you ever considered why you work so hard? Like, what are you working so hard for? Like uh, the, the healthy answer is I, I work to put food on the table, right? I, I, I work uh, because I got to pay bills. I work, uh, but I don't live to work, right? Uh, I, I, I work to be able to be responsible, but I don't get my value from the things I do for the things I, I, I run toward, right? I, I do them because I have to. I do them because it's healthy, but I don't derive my worth, my value because I get those things in Jesus. He's that living water, right? Jesus is all I want and he's all I need, right? All that I need comes from God. God, right? These are perspective shifts that we need to that we need to buy into Jesus is teaching us because he he has it all. So I don't need to chase it. So many of us are chasing wrong things. Why are you running so hard? Why are you working so hard, right? In him I'm successful. So I don't need to chase success. In him I'm worthy. I don't need to chase worth in relationships and have people validate and affirm me. In him I am what I am meant to be, a child of God. I'm not going to you know, settle for other labels. I know who I am. I'm a child of God. And we live in a society today where people are confused about who they are. They're confused about their identities. The one label that I'm going to wear, and I'm going to wear it proudly in my life is, I am a child of God. I am an heir to the throne of God. I'm a brother with Christ, in, in Christ Jesus, right? Like God is for me. God loves me. Those are labels I wear. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rebuke. I'm going to push out of my life all the other labels because I know who I am in Christ. That's the power of living water. When you have living water, you don't need to run to stale and dry wells. And when you have that encounter with Jesus, it changes everything. It totally changes your life. So this woman has this crazy encounter with Jesus. And in this moment, he told her some things and she realized who he was. He was the Messiah, the one she had hoped for. So what does this woman do? When the apostles comes back, scripture says, verse 28 of John 4, then leaving her water jar, the woman drops it. The woman went back to the town and said to the people, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah, the one we've been learning about, the one we've waited for our whole lives? <clears throat> they came out of the town and made their way toward him. Look, when I, when I became a follower of Jesus at 19, Jesus changed my life. I had a radical moment with Christ, super excited about what God had done. I wanted to tell the world. It's called your testimony. I am testifying, right, like in court, to what I saw God do in my, in my life. And I was a street kid, and then I met Jesus, and I felt the freedom 
of this living water I got to drink from, and I knew that <clears throat> I was forgiven of all my sins. I knew that God was for me, not against me. I knew that he had a purpose for my life, and I wanted to tell all of my friends. And you know what happened? I told all my friends, and many of my friends actually became followers of Jesus because of the power of the story I told, the narrative. Narratives in your life have power. Some of us live cursed today because you forgot your testimony. Some of us feel isolated and alone because we've been telling wrong stories. We've been telling stories about wrong dead wells instead of life-giving wells with water that never runs dry. So every time I told my story, every time I shared my testimony, it solidified my faith. It strengthened my courage. It reminded me of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. It kept first things first in my life. It kept God in my life. And it did the same thing with this woman. Let's get back to her story, right? So she runs back to her town. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told, he told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them and, they stay, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man is really the savior of the world. This woman, and that's the thing, right? This woman didn't run back to old behaviors, old habits, old patterns. When she ran back to the town, it wasn't to go back to her old life. She ran back to grab everyone because she was excited about drinking living water that would never run dry. And what she waited for her, old, her whole life was now in her life. And so many of you have been waiting for God to enter your life. And all you have to do is open up your heart like this woman did and simply believe by faith, placing your trust and your hope in Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus, maybe you've been walking with God 20 years, you need to remind yourself of your testimony. You need to, to remember the power of a testimony because the power of your testimony has the ability to remind you, to strengthen you, to help you chart forward in your life, but also to conquer the schemes of the evil one. Revelations 12, 11 says this, and they have conquered in him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Like, and they conquered him, the evil one because of the blood of the lamb, Jesus did that on the cross, and by the power of their testimony. So when the enemy comes to attack you, what do I do? You gotta remind him of Jesus. So when the enemy comes to tempt you, what do you do? You remind yourself, you speak life, you speak that narrative of your testimony, God saved me, God's for me, he's not against me. The psalmist says, <clears throat> I meditate on your word day and night. It's how you keep God alive. It's how you keep drinking this water that never runs dry. It's about abiding in him and him and you. And it springs forth from your life like a spring. The narrative has power in your life. Your testimony has power. It keeps you optimistic. It strengthens you through storms of life. It wards off doubt. It keeps your uh, affection on him and it conquers the enemy in your life. So many of us have lost our way. We've lost our way because we once knew living water, but we forgot all about Jesus and we got wrapped up. Church, you got wrapped up with the worries of the world, with busyness, with temptation. You've been distracted for too long and you have forgotten the story of God in your life. Your testimony is not about glorifying your past. It's glorifying Jesus over your past. It's looking at what Jesus had done and what Jesus has saved you from. And it's reminding yourself that he is indeed your first love. Guys, it's time that you return back to him, that you return back to the living waters that only Jesus can provide and get away from that well that is stagnant and dead. You will live the stories you tell. Telling your testimony strengthens your faith, keeps God's goodness and faithfulness before your eyes, it conquers the enemy, and it presents the gospel to the hungry hearts around you. I want more grace in my life. That means I gotta drink this living water. I want more of God's mercies in my life. I want more of his favor in my life. Jesus said, it is the gift of God. And if you knew who you were speaking to, you'd ask him, to give you a drink of living water. Maybe that's what we have to do. Maybe that's what you need to do. Jesus, would you give me a drink of this living water 
that is only made possible from you, Jesus, I want more grace in my life. Like crying out to God, going back to God for that spiritual fill up. Acts 4.33 says this, and with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony. They were sharing it to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. So how do I invite more grace into my life? It's about telling my testimony more. And every time I tell my testimony to myself and to others, there's a fresh outflowing of God's grace into your life. Grace for salvation, grace for obedience, grace to push through the things that bind you and hold you back. Look, we are all at different places spiritually, but no matter where you're at, whether you're like the woman from Samaria at this well, or maybe you've been walking with Jesus 20 years now and you've forgotten the power of your testimony, this is our opportunity to go back to the well. How do I do that? I invite you, Jesus, back into my life. If that's you, would you say that right now to the Lord in your heart and in your mind, Jesus? I invite you back into my life. Would you move in me? Would you change me, Holy Spirit? Would you change me? It's about diving back into his word and getting your spiritual fill up. And you know what scripture says? That he is faithful and just to forgive you of all unrighteousness. God wants to prosper you. God believes in the prosperity of his people. And prosperity isn't about the things we have. It's about the who we have. And when God is in your life, you are prosperous and you will have prosperity. Let me pray for you as uh, we open our hearts wide to Jesus and invite this living water in. <clears throat> Father God, would you forgive us of our sins? May we just lean into you this morning, God, or whenever we're listening on podcast or online, would you change our hearts? Lord God, will we realign our focus with you? Keep us from temptation, from sin. Lord God, and may we come to you to drink from the living wells that only you have, God, and not from the dry, stagnant, dead well that we run to. Lord God, keep us from running to wrong things, and may we run to right things. Lord God, ultimately, may we run to you. Bless your people, I pray, God, and may the spring that you have placed in each of us well up, Lord God, as springs of living water. In your name, Christ Jesus, amen and amen. Guys, make sure you join us next week for the final part of our message series entitled Oil Change. God has a fresh fill-up for you. I really hope that you enjoyed that content. My name is Pastor Armando. I want you to do two things. I want you to subscribe to our channel. Make sure you guys go ahead and do that and enjoy more relevant content on the stuff of life that we talk about here at Fusion Church. Second thing is check out our website, www.fusionchurchny.com. Continue to dive into our content and our online community and let's grow together.